Now, my desire today in this message is that God would open the eyes of our hearts to see the idols that are troubling us. And this has always been an issue with the human race. Uh, The first two commandments of the Ten Commandments have to do with this issue, deal with this issue. Uh, Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You should have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God knew very well that he made us to worship him. He he made us for worship. We were crafted in our minds and in our hearts to worship. And if we do not worship the one true God, you know what we're going to end up doing? We're going to worship something else because that is wired into who we are. We're not going to worship nothing. Even the atheist worships themselves. We will worship a God substitute if we do not worship the one true God. And then there's this urgent command in this section of 1 Corinthians that we have been going through and following Jesus in a world that has fallen He had been walking through all of these different things going on. And in verse 14, he simply says this, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, perhaps this was a real test for the believers that were in Corinth at this time to be invited possibly to participate in an idol feast at one of the temples. Some might feel that they were above that temptation. Perhaps they thought that it would not hurt to maybe just go once. And the apostles' inspired advice is to do what? Run away! Run away! This is what's interesting. Paul does not say study about it. He does not say become better acquainted with it. He does not say to trifle with it in any way. He says, run the other direction. See, Satan is going to spread a net for your feet. He's going to create a situation in your life, a trap on the path of your life, And you need to get around it, you need to get away from it, you need to get out of it, you need to go past it, and that all of this, you you don't want to fall into the trap, into the temptation. Now, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, what? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the, the, the truth is, is let's not be a fool and intentionally tempt ourselves. We have all fallen. We have all blown it in certain areas and have sinned, and we need to make sure we don't set this up to do it again. So God, please deliver us from the evil one. That's actually a better translation there. It says deliver from evil in many of your translations, but it really, literally, it's deliver us from the evil one, Satan. Satan is intelligent. Satan is a, a crafting temptations. So, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Now, temptations sometimes seize us, don't they? They come on us like an armed bandit. If you've ever watched the old Western movies, the armed bandit coming up on horseback behind the stagecoach. Kind of like that mentality. They'll, they'll come and, and get you. They'll seize you. They'll come up on you. And Jesus said, what? Temptations are inevitable. They're going to come. But there is a woe to the one through they come. But they're going to come. And the interesting thing is that Paul is telling us that we need to fight 
We need to stand firm by running away. It's a weird image, sort of, stand by running. So in other words, you're still filled with the Spirit. You're still one with the Lord. You're going to get past this moment. You're going to get past this temptation. You're still going to be walking with Jesus, but you need to be fleeing from that temptation. That's what he's calling you to do, to flee from idol worship. Now, idol worship... He's talking about here, as if you've been with us, is in this case an organized system of a pagan religion been worked out for centuries, and they had a shrine, they had a temple, they had offerings that were being offered, animal sacrifices to the gods and goddesses, they would cook the meat, the priests would eat some of it, just like the Levitical priests, and they had extra meat sometimes, and they would sell that in the meat market, and we've been talking about that over the last few weeks. So they have all of this meat going on, and it's kind of like a carnival. And that's actually literally what it was. How many of you know what the literal term for carnival means? It means flesh being cooked. Isn't that interesting? Carne, flesh, levar to remove. So this carnival was an evil thing for them. And the Corinthian Christians had to walk by this. They knew it well. They, they knew there was no way really to get around it. They just had to walk by it to get to their homes and to get where they worked or, or different things. And there it was. They could smell it. It's like going past wood fire grill or something every time you go by it or whatever barbecue place you could smell the carnival going on you could smell the meat market and they could see the temple and the shrine and the prostitutes and it kind of reminds me if you zip back into the old testament with daniel and his friends in daniel chapter three sorry i'm not talking about you dude There was some kind of music that was going to go on. There was some sort of loud music and everyone was called to fall down and bow down to a golden statue in Daniel chapter 3 and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow. In In a sense, they were fleeing from that temptation. So there's this organized system of pagan religion. They need to flee from that. Don't take part of that. But idolatry is much bigger than just that one temple in Corinth. One writer gives this definition on idolatry. Worshiping anything other than the true God in the true way. Worshiping anything other than the true God in the true way. I think that's a pretty good definition, but nowhere near the best definition, which is found in Romans 1, 25. You can turn there if you want and look. It's a key verse. Just listen if you don't want to turn there right now. And we read it earlier. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things more than the Creator, who is forever praised. I think there it is. There's your biblical definition of idolatry, to worship and serve a created thing, a creature, whatever, more than the Creator. Any created thing that seizes our souls is an idol. Well, why is this a big deal? Why is this important? And Paul goes into that in verses 15 through 17 to start with. The first reason he states is that Christian worship is intimate sharing with Christ. He jumped, Let's jump into verse 15. Well, let's go back to 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread and we are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. 
And he's really talking about here what we just did a few minutes ago, obviously, with communion. But he's talking about Christian worship. And he begins by, Paul begins by reasoning with us. Paul's very reasonable teacher. He reasons things out. There is a ton of logic in Paul's epistles. And all true religion begins with the mind. It begins with how you think. And Paul's got the win, the battle of the mind, the transformation of the mind by the Spirit through the Word of God. That's how faith changes. You know, it's a quick question in our own lives. You know, I say I'm a believer, I am a believer. Well, do I think differently than I did before? Do I live differently because I think differently? And he says there, I speak to prudent, uh, sensible people. He's he's like, hey, I'm, I'm speaking to reasonable people here. And he's saying idolatry makes us fools. There's a foolishness to idolatry. In Romans 1, again, 22 and 23, although they claimed to be wise, they became what? Fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. There's this essentially uh, foolishness. And I really believe it's this. When it all comes down to this, everyone, I believe Satan is mocking the human race by getting us to bow down to these kinds of statues made to look like a mortal man and animals and birds and reptiles and crystals. I mean, I grew up in Arizona and you'd go up to the Sedona area and it was just an extra serving of weird. Crystals everywhere and vortexes and all of this type of stuff that they were claiming. And you could just see Satan in your mind just laughing. Like, you guys are fools. Look what I made you do. And the Holy Spirit has come to rescue us from that foolishness. Christ has become our wisdom. He is our wisdom. He makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul urges them to think. Think, everyone. Just think. To reason it out. I'm I'm speaking to prudent, sensible people. Judge this for yourself. This should not be something that's hard to understand. And he goes into the essence of worship. And And you may underestimate this sometimes in your own life, and maybe you're a newer believer and you haven't really thought all of this true through, but I also believe that those of us who have been believers for a while, I think we know this more and more as we go along. Worship is a spiritual unity with a deity. A spiritual union with a deity. There's a fellowship that we share with an invisible spiritual being, an intimate sharing with the deity, a mystical union. And that's true of either true worship of the triune God, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and it's also true, everyone, of pagan worship. There is a mystical union that's going on in worship. That is what Paul is saying here. When we worship Christ, we are intimately spiritually connected with him. When we worship pagan idols, we are intimately spiritually connected with the idol. Don't underestimate the intimate spiritual connection that is going on here. That is what Paul is saying. And then he's looking deeper into this idea of what the Lord's Supper means. Once again, something that we do around here every week. And there is a reason. It is not an empty ritual. It is a remembrance, yes. But it is also a time of a spiritual connection with Christ and what he has done with us. Paul reaches for the central main element of Christian worship. You know what? We spend 25, 30 minutes singing to the Lord, and that's part of worship. But that's not the center of it. The center of it 
is the Lord's Supper. Did you realize that? He's going to talk much more about that in chapter 11, and we'll get to that in a few weeks here. And he's, he's talking about the, the Lord's Supper, and he's, he's like, behind these elements of bread and wine, there is a spiritual reality. Now, the bread and the wine do not turn into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That is not happening. But what is happening is a spiritual reality that the Holy Spirit is behind this and that we need to yearn to participate in the Lord's Supper. It is not just a memorial. It is not just an empty ritual. It's a spiritual union that's going on here. There is a word here, koinia, that is being used. A sharing. A sharing. A sharing in the blood of Christ. A sharing together in the blood of Christ. When you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, what cleanses sin? His blood. His blood cleansed your sin. You're sharing in that remembrance. You're sharing in what He has done. And he's plainly saying, if you've been united with him in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. There is this union between us and Jesus. Is that amazing or what? That's the first example. So he's saying there, Christian worship is intimately sharing with Christ. Secondly, he goes on in verses 18 through 20 to say pagan worship is intimately sharing with what? Let's read. Verse 18, look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be sharers in demons. This this is some heavy stuff. Now he gives an example to start with the Jewish sacrifice in verse 18. The animal sacrificial system... Paul knew it was already obsolete by this time, but he looked back at the Jewish history. And I had to kind of think about this verse a little bit this week. I was kind of pondering, you know, what, what's a good way for us to understand this in Jewish history? And I, when animal sacrifices were offered in a right way through the Spirit, there was a participation of the people together at the altar. And, and let me give you an example of I think both the good and the bad, the good of uh, the Old Testament in worshiping God with a sacrifice and the bad of worshiping idols. And I think one of the easiest ones for us to picture is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And if you know that story, there are essentially two sacrifices going on, weren't there? There were two sacrifices, two altars, two animals sacrificed. They were the, the prophets of Baal were, were crying out, and, and we know that, they, that Baal never answered. Elijah pours water on the thing, and it's drenched in water, and he prays a simple prayer, and fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. Everything is like, whack! This is one of the moments I would have loved to have been there. And what happened afterwards. Because what happened to the people at that moment that were on Elijah's side, they fell down and they were like, the Lord, the Lord is the Lord. He is God. The Lord, He is God. It was a real spiritual fire that fell from heaven to their hearts as well. And God was turning idolatrous people of Israel back to worshiping Him and loving Him. The participation in the actual sacrifice meant something. There was a physical fire on the altar, but what happened in the heart? 
It's like a spiritual fire that came down. And that's really in verse 18 then, look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifice sharers in the altar? That's what's going on here. But there's something even deeper. And this is something that I think we need to understand more and more in our world today. Let me give you a statement I live by spiritually. Nothing is neutral. Nothing is neutral in this life. And I think we see that in verses 19 and 20. There is actually a spiritual presence in false worship. There is a demonic reality behind it. Paul has to address the earlier basic teaching that we got in chapter 8, verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing and a meat offered is just meat. Well, that's not the complete story. Yes, an idol is a physical idol. It's physical stuff. There's nothing there. But behind it is what? A demon. Zeus, Aphrodite, Venus, Hermes, Apollo. They didn't exist. But the demons behind them did to deceive people, lead them into false worship. It's demonic. It's taught in the Old Testament, everyone, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Song of Moses. It was a prediction before the Jewish people ever went into the promised land. In Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 15, Israel made God jealous with their foreign gods and angered Him with their detestable idols. Verse 17, they they sacrifice to demons, which are not God, gods that they had not known, gods that recently appeared, gods your fathers did not fear. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. You're worshiping demons. And that's said before they even started doing it. So the idols aren't real, the demons behind them are. Now, this is what this does teach, everyone. It is super dangerous to believe that all religions are the same. There's one true God. All other religions then have what behind them? A demon or demons. Acts 19. There's a shrine in Ephesus that we know about that this uh, Paul would have been talking about there, the shrine of the temple of Artemis. The origin was actually somewhat supernatural. There was this image of the goddess that fell from heaven And you can be like, well, that's nothing. It was like a meteorite or something or, you know, something that was like that. Maybe there was an image of a goddess that fell from heaven on the face of a tortilla. (laughs) And they framed it and they put it up. They built a world famous temple around that. And I think this is an indication of supernatural origin of false worship, false religion. I'll give you another one. This one's real easy to see, Islam. In the year 610 AD, Muhammad went into a cave and had an overpowering encounter with a supernatural being who he later identified as the angel Gabriel. And and this powerful being seized him physically and shook him and basically effectively beat him up. And in the end, after a number of encounters, commanded him to recite something. And that's where the word Quran comes from. And that's where the Quran had its origin and that super 
natural encounter with what he believed was an angel of light. But we know from 2 Corinthians that Satan masquerades as what? Angel of light. Mormonism. There's a demon behind Mormonism. What do you say? Joseph Smith, the originator of that false religion, had an encounter with an angel called Moroni. And he told him that there were these gold plates in upstate New York and reciting from that gave us the and the world the Book of Mormon. And I believe that there was a real supernatural encounter between a demon and Joseph Smith. And I think that this is true of all false religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, all of the false religions and systems have a demonic origin according to who? Not Scott, according to Paul, the Apostle Paul, God's Word. There's a supernatural power behind them. There is no such thing as being neutral on other faiths, everyone. Now, We are called to lovingly share the truth with people. They may or may not accept that truth, but we cannot tell them a lie and say that their faith is okay. Do you want to see people deceived? Do you want to see people deceived by demons? No, I don't. Not if you really love someone. We share the truth. We go on, verse 21. The third reason we see here that Paul talks about idolatry is that it provokes the Lord to jealousy. Quite simply, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. This is, this is bad stuff. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Idolatry provokes the Lord to jealousy. God will not share His bride, the church, with anyone else. Now that makes me feel pretty good. As a member of his body, as a member of his family, as a member of his church, and all of you who are believers as well, the members of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is pretty awesome that God will not share us with anyone else. You are his and His alone. There is an exclusive love He has for the hearts of His people. And He will not share you with any dumb demon. He will not share you with idols. Deuteronomy 32.21 They made me jealous by what is no God. They angered me with worthless idols. And then he says very powerfully, are we stronger than he? Man, doesn't our world kind of live like that now? I'm stronger than God. I don't think you're going to like the outcome of that. (laughs) Important application point, everyone. You don't want to take God on. You don't want to make him jealous. And he will not share you with an idol. And as a believer, that is an awesome thing. So here are the applications as we roll through the last few minutes of this. We need to understand that we can make an idol out of any created thing. 
How can you find them then in your life? If you're like, okay, how do I find the idols in my life? Four things. First, look at your imagination. What do you do in your solitude? What do you do when you're alone? What do you think about? What do you imagine? Where does your mind go? Yeah, a single daydream doesn't prove that it's an idol, but if you're just again and again fantasizing and thinking about something that is not Christ, it's not God, there's an indication that you're heading down the road to an idol. Secondly, look at your money. What do you spend your money on? One of the saddest things I ever had to do early on in ministry One of our youth group kids, uh, her dad died tragically. And so we were getting ready to do the the funeral. And we, we knew he wasn't a believer. And so that makes memorial services pretty difficult in some ways. In other ways, it doesn't because you get to share Christ and his love and what what that means but everything about that memorial service was about his boat you know what was worshiped in his memorial service his stupid boat we were sitting there the whole time like this boat has been referenced 40 times Everyone that got up and talked about it was this boat. They actually buried him with a little replica of his boat, thinking that that was cool. What was his idol? Boat. Did the boat get him to heaven? No, it sank. It's sad. What do you spend your money on? If I, I would just make an argument here. If it's not to glorify Christ, if it's not about advancing the key, kingdom, ultimately the ministry of the church, the Lord tells us to give cheerfully and sacrificially. If something else again and again and again, gets the resources over how you take care of your family. You know, remember that, that God asks ultimately not for 100%. He allows you to take care of your family. And, and you, in the Old Testament, the, the standard was a tithe, 10% which meant 90% went to a lot of other things. But I know people that, quite honestly, maybe have never given a dime to church, to their local church. And you have to go, we, we, need, to, we need to look at the heart. We need to look at the heart. Third, what about unanswered prayers and how you handle that? And what I mean by unanswered, not answered in the way that you wanted them answered. How do you react when you don't get what you want in life? If your reaction is unbiblical, I think you got some idols going. Because then that leads into the fourth one, uncontrollable emotions. We're going to go back to that word carnal, carnival, carnally angry, burning, over the top. What makes you over the top mad that's not connected to Christ? Now, there's a, there's a righteous anger, right? But that righteous anger is in the fact that Something is going on that is that is defaming God and defaming Christ, and there's a righteous anger, but most of the time, that's not the anger we're dealing with. 
I have to have my way or I'm going to be angry. There's a root idol in there somewhere. Imagination, money, disappointments, strong, unbiblical emotions indicate idols. Those are all easy things to kind of look at and go, I've got idol problems going on. The application point for what to do and deal with it is the same for both those who are Christians and are not Christians. Those of you who are here today outside of Christ, you need to understand something that's pretty cool. Jesus is an idol destroyer. Jesus is an idol destroyer. He will destroy your idols by putting himself and all of his glory and beauty and power in its place. And where is its place? First place. He wants to put himself and all of his glory and all of his beauty and all of his majesty in the place it needs to be. Remember, idols are what we follow when Jesus isn't enough. And so I say this week the same thing I said last week. Flee from the idols and run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Jesus came to die on the cross for your idolatry, for my idolatry, all the ways that that we've sinned with idols. He came to take all the wrath on himself and die. So give him all of the burdens, give him all of the idols, because idols are heavy. I mean, think about the precious metals and some of those idols that actually are made of wood and stone and precious metal. They're heavy. The idols of Babylon had to be put in an ox cart and the ox could barely drag them. They're heavy. Our sins, our idols are heavy. And only one can bear the weight. Christ. Give your idols to Jesus. Give your sins to him. Let him and his death on the cross be the substitute and the savior for you and nothing else. And when you give the idols over to him, when you flee from idolatry, you run to Christ, you are free. You are free indeed.